everyone, it's Vanessa. I'm here to wrap up some of the books that I've read so far in February. I've already read more than I read in last month and I just feel like my wrap up is going to be too long if I wait till the end of the month. Um, I'm also going to be out of town at the end of the month so I thought it'd be good to just get started on the books that I've already read. 13 books. I think I will divide them by like what type they are so I've read fiction, nonfiction, and graphic novels and that's how I'll talk about them. And then that way you can fast forward if you don't care as much about one thing or the other. I think I will start with graphic novels and that's the first thing that I read this month. I read Go With The Flow. And this is a brand new graphic novel. It focuses on a group of friends and basically like period equality in their school. They all have a different way of how they think about their period. It all starts with one girl getting her period in the middle of school and they're not being pads or tampons for her in the bathroom for her to use. One other of the girls is really incentivized to kind of become an activist for getting pads and tampons available to everybody at the school which is awesome and then one other girl has like very difficult periods you know the kind of pain that she suffers through it as a result and then there's like a comedic person as well who kind of makes everybody laugh so there's very different girls it's a sweet friendship story it's a story about like how you get together to impact change in your school as a younger person. Um, I thought it had a great message. I really liked the art. It was very cutesy and it was fast paced as a story. I would definitely recommend it. I thought it was pretty good. The next graphic novel that I read I do have because Go With The Flow was on hold for somebody else. The next one that I read was Taproot and this is a story about a gardener and a ghost. This is by Kesey Young. It focuses, like it says, on a gardener and a ghost. The thing that I took away from this story is that it doesn't really explain this world or why they exist. It kind of just is and it is a love story between these two. It's a queer love story. So that's kind of like what drew me into it and also the art. I really enjoy the way that the art looks but I just didn't really connect with the characters or the story the way that it all was introduced to us. I was kind of confused as to why this was happening, um, the kind of the conflict between them because I just didn't feel like I knew the characters well enough to understand why they had conflict. I didn't feel like I was really in this graphic novel understanding all of the things going on and all of the characters motivations so I wish that I liked it more than I did. The next graphic novel that I read are two that I do not have. One is Sisters which was a reread for me. This is by Raina Talgemeier. I read this for the first time three years ago is what my Goodreads said so I hadn't read it in a long time and I had originally given it like three and a half stars and upon this reread I just felt like I really connected with it. I loved it so much more. There were parts that made me laugh so hard that I didn't really remember. One of the best reread experiences I've had in a really long time honestly. Usually when I reread a book it ends up going down in rating. It doesn't ever really go up but this was probably the first time I felt like I really needed to bump up my rating. It's a really fun story if you like stories about sisters, family dynamics, and kind of conflict between families and like real life issues that families go through. They take a road trip and um, you know things happen when you're on a road trip with your family you kind of all go a little stir crazy inside of a small moving vehicle yeah I just really really enjoyed my time with this reread we did read this for my graphic novel book club that I have for fourth through sixth graders that we did last week and it seemed like the kids really really enjoyed this book as much as I did and they had a lot of fun with the discussions of it and I think it was a great book to kick off our graphic novel book club then the other graphic novel slash it's a comic really is Strange Planet which I also had to give it back because it had a huge hold list and I really enjoyed these. They were really funny. Kind of like you could read one single comic and then not pick up the book for two days and then read another one and just have another little chuckle. The whole gimmick of it is that Nathan W. Pyle kind of creates fake words to describe like everyday household objects that we have and that is mostly where the comedy comes from is him like calling you know toasters strange things or vacuums strange things. Really fun and enjoyable if you're looking for short comics or if you follow the Instagram account and kind of want to see them all in one place. And then the last graphic novel that I want to talk about is one that I finished last night and it is Space Boy Volume 1. I was kind of confused looking at the cover of this, right? This series is called Space Boy but we are following a girl in this first comic. Her name is Amy and she lives in deep space on this mining community and her father 
loses his job and they have to move to earth and so it's them trying to acclimate to earth life their family like going through like physical therapy to acclimate to the world and then also kind of like the emotional difficulties of moving because you're leaving friends behind you're like in cryogenic sleep and coming to earth and so you're asleep for 30 years and people keep living without you and then you have to make new friends on earth too which is what amy is trying to do in her new school quirky thing about this book is that she feels like she can uh, detect flavors from people is what she calls it and so people can have like a bubblegum flavor or um, like a hot pepper flavor so that kind of means like stuff about their personality but she cannot detect the flavor of this one boy who I believe is the space boy that we haven't really gotten to know in this volume she can't detect what he is like and so she that makes her curious and he's kind of like a mystery in this school nobody really knows who he quite is this is a five volume series which I didn't know when I was getting into it really not much happens here a lot of it is just like world building and and showing you all of the characters I think I am curious enough that I'm going to pick up volume two the storytelling here I really liked if you look inside it is mostly the internal like thoughts that Amy is having and then very little dialogue it is mostly what she is thinking about being in this new place I like that in graphic novels I like when it's more about like the the thoughts than it is about the dialogue. Um, I feel like we get to know the character so much more this way. There's a lot more character development possible. I also just really love the art. There are some pages in here that are, are really quite beautiful. This is kind of like the style that I, I really like. I think that's gorgeous. I love the colors. Um, I love like the tracing. Let me find this one page that I was like, this is what I need to show booktube. This page. I love that color palette so much. I think I will go on to volume two. Oh no, I forgot one comic. But you already know about this. <laughs> I talked about this in my uh, vlog that I just posted recently. It's Fence Volume 3. Finally, I'm caught up with Fence. There's no more Fence. This is another really great volume in this series. Um, very interesting to see how it's all developing and who's actually on the Fence team now. I feel like I've talked enough about Fence. Uh, this is what the art looks like if you are not aware of this series. It's kind of kawaii in parts and then like very macho serious in other parts. The way they draw the faces when they're farther away versus when they're more close up. Okay, so that's it for graphic novels and let's see... Let's do fiction next, I think. I didn't read that many fiction books this year, this month. So just two fiction books. The first one I also talked about in my um, vlog that I just posted, so I won't mention it too much. It is From the Desk of Zoe Washington by Janae Marks. It looks at this girl named Zoe who is an aspiring baker and wants to basically be on this kid's baking show. So she's trying out all these baking recipes. At the same time, she's just discovered a letter that came to her house that is the first point of contact that she's had with her bio dad who is in prison um, for a crime that he says he did not commit. So it's kind of Zoe trying to get to know him, feeling like, can I trust this person who is in prison? Realizing that he is just a good person, a good human, and trying to figure out what happened with this case that went so wrong, and finding out about the Innocence Project, finding out about, um, you know, people who are in prison for crimes they did not commit, and how prevalent that can be, it kind of shatters her world and makes her think in many different ways, um, and it's her plight to get her father out of prison. This is a realistic fiction story, it's a contemporary, it's um, like a nice cozy read with social justice messages that I, I like reading about. Um, it has a very hopeful ending which I think is great for metal gray readers which is what this book who this book is for it is a little starry-eyed and maybe slightly unbelievable in parts because it is so happy-go-lucky towards the end of it um, but I enjoyed it I really enjoyed my time with this one I would recommend it to people who like to read realistic fiction and the last fiction book that I read is one I finished a couple days ago and it's a hype book I feel like that I've been seeing a lot of and it's such a fun age by Kylie Reed. I listened to this mostly and then I kind of kept up with the physical copy. This book follows a black babysitter who takes care of this white little girl named Briar. She's basically stopped at a late night grocery store um, because she's with this white child. Obviously she's her the babysitter. It kind of goes from there. Some of that is filmed and then it's her developing a relationship with 
both the person that she sits for, the mom, and um, a new guy in her life. There's a lot of like coincidental situations that happen in this book that show you like where all three of these people came from, what their history is with each other. I think part of that is where I had some issues with this book for its discussions of like transactional relationships and like you do something but really you're trying to virtue signal something about yourself by doing that thing um, as a white person and kind of like liberal racism in that way. The revenge plot in here too was something that I didn't really foresee coming and I think that probably is my main issue with this book is that I did not believe and I did not buy into the issue, the embarrassing moment, the thing that happened that basically is a catalyst for the rest of the book. The other thing that I didn't really love was the dialogue. I felt like it was choppy and sometimes a little bit cringy and I think this came through way more in the audiobook which is how I mostly consumed it. So I feel like if you read it it's a little bit easier to digest all of that. Like there's a baby voice in in the audiobook that I I had to keep listening to and yeah, I didn't really love that. It's not something that like takes away from like the themes and messages and um, kind of like the arc of the story, but it's something that kind of picked at me while I was reading it, so I didn't love those parts as much. I liked it. I didn't like love it. It's not an automatic best book of the year for me. Again, I'm trying here with adult fiction. If you have any recommendations for me, let me know in the comments. But I'm reading adult fiction this year and I'm proud of myself for that. Alright, let's talk about nonfiction. I read quite a lot of nonfiction this month and I'm really happy because I'm trying to keep on top of like that 50-50 split that I tried to do at the end of last year with 50-50 nonfiction fiction. I'm doing really good at that so far. So the first nonfiction book that I read in February is The Great Pretender by Susanna Cahalan and I always mispronounce her name. I always feel like the L comes before the H and I say Callahan but it's Cahalan and I need to imprint that in my brain. I kind of thought this was a disappointing read and I I felt kind of like I was sold something that I didn't really get. When I was reading this book, I thought that we were going to learn about this experiment, these trials that they did in the 1970s. That's kind of like what the jacket says. This made people think differently about state of psychiatry and putting people into mental hospitals and that sort of thing. I just felt like the thesis wasn't there. I felt like it was just random chapters about trying to find more information about this case. This case not being that intense or that revelatory to psychiatry's, you know, the movement of psychiatry and like how we think about psychiatry today. And I think she was pulling at straws for a lot of the book and kind of just finding people and talking about different historical elements that, you know, go through the evolution of psychiatry. So it's like part telling you the history of psychiatry, part telling you this very specific moment in psychiatry's history, which is which is the experiments in 1973, and then also part memoir. She wrote Brain on Fire, so she has a lot of insight into being in that world because she herself went through a lot of the things that these people went through in 1973. She's very, I think, critical of that because she could have ended up in a mental hospital for the rest of her life for something that was really more biological. She does feel a certain way about mental institutions and psychiatry in general. But overall, what I felt mostly is that this was a jumbled book and it didn't have a clear beginning, middle, and end. And it didn't have an arc that led you from one part of the story to the next to learn about these historical aspects she was talking about. I definitely liked Brain on Fire way more. The next nonfiction book that I read is This Is Going to Hurt by Adam Kay. I listened to this one on audiobook and it's mostly just like little snippets from a medical resident as he's like climbing up the ranks from being like a medical student to like actually being a legit doctor in the NHS in the UK. Just stories about dealing with patients and dealing with the government and dealing with what all of that means for his personal life as well because it takes away so much from his personal life. And the stories are more like chuckle under your breath, dark kind of humor, how he feels like his hands are tied and that there's not really progress happening that he would want. And that did lead him to leave the medical profession, which is kind of sad. And then he has like a very poignant discussion about that, about leaving and what we could do to help the NHS. So if you're interested in, in stories about the medical profession, like all of their, their issues that they deal with and quirks from talking to lots of patience. I think this is an interesting story and an interesting little memoir about it. It's nice and short and you get the gist. The next book that I read, I do have a copy. It is 
my first five-star read of 2020. It is How We Fight for Our Lives by Saeed Jones. This is a very short memoir that I mostly listened to on audiobook. I kept up a little bit with the book and it's his memoir of growing up black, gay, in the south, trying to find himself, his relationship with his mother, going to college. It's very difficult for him to kind of come to terms with the sexuality and how to express that sexuality in a way that is not toxic, especially when you're in your early 20s and you're kind of trying to discover who you are and like pushing boundaries. There's a lot of vulnerable, dark, depressing stories in this book and definitely I, I cried reading parts of this book because I could feel the things that he went through were not like easy walks in the park. Why I valued this book so much is that he felt comfortable enough somehow to write it out for us, but to also just take a journey into his life through his writing. I think his writing is really beautiful in this book. He does have a poetry background and I think that shines through in this book. I, I felt moved many, many times in different passages of this book. I think it has a great arc from his childhood to where he is now and I definitely recommend this book. Just be aware that there's a lot of graphic moments in this book and a lot of vulnerable moments in this book but I feel like it was so honest. Wow I'm very impressed because I would like to hide all of my dark moments <laughs> unlike him sharing it with us. A beautiful book I definitely recommend. The next nonfiction book that I read is Shrill by Lindy West. I'm excited because I've already read one book from my um, five-star TBR predictions. Sadly, it did not get five stars, but it did get four, which means it was a great read. These are mostly just essays of Lindy West and her time on the internet writing for publications online and kind of the backlash and the things she gets told because she identifies as a fat woman and because she says things out loud on the internet that maybe other people don't really want to hear from her. And she's very unapologetic in that way, so I, I value that aspect of learning why she feels that way and, and to see her confidence in action on the internet basically. I thought it was really compassionate and funny and witty. It made me chuckle when I was walking my dog and I thought that it had personal moments as well where we got to learn about her family and her husband um, which I also really enjoyed. One more book! Woohoo! The last nonfiction book that I read and I just finished maybe yesterday is this one, Antisocial, which I didn't originally talk in my TBR about because it's one that I've had out from the library since December and it's it was one of those that in my TBR I was like, if I end up reading them, I'll talk about them then because sometimes I feel like I, uh, I make promises and I don't come through. But this is a nice surprise, the fact that I actually did read this book. My issue was that it, it did not have an audiobook that I could I could listen to and so I asked one of my library systems to please buy this audiobook and they did in like less than a week. So then I got it, I was the first person on hold and then that's how I consumed this book, I listened to it. I think that's a great way to do it. I really enjoyed the narration by the author, um, Andrew Morentz. He is a journalist for The New Yorker so he's got that like journalistic voice and kind of integrity in his narration. This book is not a happy one. <laughs> I want to tell you up front that there's a lot of disgusting vile things that he talks about in this book and it focuses on online extremists in the alt-right and alt-light movements. Um, you know, the people that are not as bad as neo-Nazis but in my opinion still say and do things that are not to be condoned. It's also about techno-utopians and that means looking into the history of Reddit and Facebook and um, the people who founded those companies and basically how Frankenstein's monster has gone away from them and how their creations really cannot be controlled. The power that they thought that they could wield over their own creations is no more in the social media age of 2020 compared to the beginnings of the 2000s. Um, and the hijacking of the American conversation in part is how how these trolls and how these alt-right and alt-light figures propagate on the internet, on Reddit, on Twitter, on Facebook, and how they attract people to them. I learned three big things reading this book and I want to leave you with those three things and if any of those three things interests you, like you want to learn more about what is that thing, read this book because I feel like those things came up so many times over the course of this book and those are the three main things I'm taking away from it. Number one is the sailor strategy and the way that they discuss this in this book, it's this new strategy that basically is trying to tell politicians to not worry about the southern strategy anymore of concealing what you mean in coded racial terms, what you mean, like saying states rights or things like that to win votes and to appeal 
to that racism. And the sales strategy basically says just be so honest about what you actually mean and just say the the political thing you mean and it will not cost you votes. They did some analysis of it to see if that was the case. Um, obviously, as we saw in the 2016 election, you can say really bad things and still get elected into office. Just say what you mean. It's not going to lose you that many votes and it's going to bring new people to you anyway, which is depressing. Um, number two, the number two thing I learned about this is the Overton window. It's not a term that I had heard before and I feel like I'm politically aware, but if you haven't heard about it like I didn't, um, the Overton window is basically this range of ideas that are politically okay in our day and age, in the mainstream, and how we talk about politics. So we know that it's not okay to say some things. They are not viable politically and you will be run out of town by saying those things. Um, and what these people in these movements are basically saying is that they want to push the boundaries in what is politically viable to say and do in this day and age. And so the Overton window is constantly moving and what is okay to say is constantly shifting. They're trying to push it just a little bit at a time until soon it's been pushed so much that the idea is just entirely acceptable now. So that's their goal is to continue pushing the Overton window. Terrifying. <laughs> Number two thing, also horrible. The third thing that I learned reading this book is activating emotion. That is a new phrase for me and it's a phrase that I feel like in my mind I, I feel like I understood the process of it but the fact that I can name it now taught me a lot. Activating emotion is the feeling that you feel when you see something that outrages you on the internet. Um, it's the thing that causes you fear or disgust or anger. That activating emotion has an impact in what you're going to do with your social media presence when you come across these tweets, posts, videos, whatever. You want to share in your outrage. You want to say, I don't stand for this. What that means is that you're clicking on these things. You are sharing this thing. You are causing this thing to have engagement. Just even clicking on the tweet without clicking on the video is giving them engagement. It's showing the alt-right and alt-light folks that you are listening to what they are saying. I feel like after the election happened, this was me like 24 seven, like I don't stand for this. This is not what I believe. and. I want to I want to make everybody aware that I'm on this side instead of on the side of you saying, you know, Mexicans are rapists or whatever it is that you're saying that's vile to me. I'm getting emotional right now. You can just see the activating emotion activating inside of me. Andrew Morantz is really coming to discuss here is that this activating emotion is not necessarily a good thing for us to continue doing because it is bringing light and bringing new followers to people who wouldn't have been found because we wouldn't be sharing their content. So the fact that I'm retweeting, you know, Caitlin Bennett or whoever on Twitter to say what what is going on here is bringing more people to learn about Caitlin Bennett, which is giving her more notor notoriety, which is giving her more opportunities to continue talking about what she believes in. What are we giving her? We're giving her more of a platform to reach other people who think like her when she can just not be talked about. Activating motion, a goal for myself. I will try so very hard when I come across a video, a tweet, something that activates emotion to not feel the emotion publicly because it will give more attraction to these things. You know, compare that to reading legit news that doesn't have an activating emotion, an automatic activating emotion, and it's news that's still very important that I should be clicking and should be reading and should be consuming and should be sharing. I have to think about that more of outrage and expressing my outrage versus reading things that are making my brain smarter and learning more about how people are living and doing life. I think that's my final my final thought on this is that this was an interesting book. I will say at parts it was a little bloated, it was a little repetitive, especially like in the last 100 pages I was like I'm tired of learning about their personal lives. I don't care that they have Jewish wives that somehow are still with them even though they're anti-Semites. So I didn't really care that much about the personal insight into these people. I cared more about like the system and the, the thing that they're using, the infrastructure that they're using to try to gain more followers and to be more seen. I thought that it was worth the read. All the things that I read and I am sweating now because 
that book incites activating emotion apparently um thank you so much for watching my video i hope that you enjoyed it if you're interested in any of these books or would like to read any of these books let me know in the comments and i'll see you in my next video bye bye